Good morning, everyone. Um, very pleased to be here. Thank you, Andres, and thank you to um, Plainsight for inviting me. I'm really going to be talking a bit about the commons from the perspective of the user, um, from the passenger, from the pedestrian, um, from the human being, and how we sort of experience these kinds of spaces, transportation, um, how they impact us, and the opportunity we have to actually shape our own experience um, of the built environment and of these places. So I really I think that we really need, when we talk about the airport and commons, um, we really need to go back to the beginning of the last century um, in terms of the, the role that train stations, which were sort of the prototype, uh, how they functioned. Um, train stations, metro stations, airports, they're all points of arrival and departures and gateways to cities. Um, but due to the nature of their ownership structures, security issues, um, precautions, you know, airports actually operate more like federal buildings, federal office buildings, courthouses, IRS offices, and privately owned shopping malls than true public spaces. So if we sort of think about what is the the passenger experience, the differences there, I think we can sort of start unpacking um, what it is airports are trying to either mitigate against or recreate um, for people, um, for their own customers. So key difference between traveling on a plane and traveling by train is the length of the journey to the facility, the length of the journey from the facility. Are you walking to the train um, or are you driving hours in traffic, you know, and then walking? Uh, the amount of preparation, um, luggage, dog carriers, strollers, going on an airplane versus lunch and your laptop on a train. Um, the number of travelers, travelers in groups, families, multi-generational at airports versus you on the 7 a.m. commuter line. Um, whom you will encounter along the way, your neighbors, your friends, your coworkers, uh, versus people from all over the world um, without shared culture or shared language. And of course, the stress level um, caused by the, the potential for confusion, for getting lost, missing your plane, um, figuring out how long security is going to take you Tuesday morning at, at 8 a.m. Uh, versus just catching the next train or subway at the station if you happen to miss that. Um, so those are some of where these comparisons kind of you can sort of there's a, a differential there. But, what I believe is that up until 15 or 20 years ago, the ideas of train stations as places did not exist. And I would argue that we wouldn't even be discussing airports as town commons without these predecedent efforts aimed at thinking beyond the station. Um, and these were projects I've worked on, a project for public spaces with New Jersey Transit, with Sam Trans in San Mateo County, um, here in Los Angeles, around the world. Um, when we had meetings with Amtrak, this is probably in the mid-90s, um, they, they described their own train stations as Amshacks. That was their words. Um, and basically, um, we were also told that uh, stations were nodes along a line whose only purpose was to provide somewhere for the self-loading freight to huddle out of the rain before they got on and off the train. Okay, so that was the idea. We were, if it weren't for those bloody commuters, boy, those trains would really run on time. And then I think in the mid-1990s, um, these transit agencies sort of recognized um, that they were actually gateways and nodes and portals into communities. And communities recognized that these stations, these facilities represented sometimes the largest public investment in their town. And that they were empty every weekend. And from like 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., these gorgeous parking lots were just sitting there. And these conversations were very awkward at first, started to happen about using the community, taking ownership of those facilities as public investments. And asking permission to have the farmer's market um, in the parking lot, and the first night celebration in the station, and art exhibits, um, and food trucks, et cetera. And there was like all of these issues that were about li liability and insurance and, but what we were looking at was an incredibly underutilized, very expensive in some case, public asset, real estate, as well as infrastructure, as well as buildings. So how do you maximize 
the use of these facilities, especially off hours. So transit agencies began forging these partnerships um, and with communities and host cities to leverage their investment by programming and designing these civic infrastructures to function as destinations in and of themselves. A place you will go, the train station in South Orange, New Jersey, has the best coffee, the best children's clothing store, um, outdoor dining. People go there all the time. They may never get on a train. You go to Bradley Beach Station because they have a wonderful local bakery. You may never get on a train, um, but you go there to have to meet with your friends and neighbors. So is that anything? Does the airport operators have, you know, coming to the same conclusion? Is that a potentiality where these places can attract and serve a wider range of publics and public functions? But in order to generate this greater leverage, the value of the shared uh, public realm. Subway stations, metros have tried the same thing, bringing the sun underground with art, music, exhibitions. The, the London Underground, all their posters were advertisements of fabulous places the underground would take you. So they were actually marketing um, destinations. Um, LA Metro has done a great job with incorporating art into their stations that give you a sense of what is above ground, so that transparency. Uh, if you never get out of the station, you know you know the film canisters, you know that's where Hollywood and Vine is, might be wrong there. So that, that's, kind of where, that's kind of where things um, are. And um, so this creating a sense of place at airports is really intriguing. Um, is it to enhance the traveler's experience? or like the London Underground, is, that in, is it to encourage them to visit that city on a return trip, not just to change planes? So um, why are they doing this? We were doing some work a long time ago at Denver, Denver Airport. And this, is anyone here from Denver Airport? Okay, you're gonna confirm whether or not this is true. We were told that 60% of the travelers through the Denver Airport changed planes and never set foot in Denver. They're just through passengers. So their idea was to capture visitor dollars, and I think a lot of this is true for transit passengers. How do you get, how do you capture those dollars that are not going into, the people that are not going into downtown? Um, and then how do you give people a sense that, hey, I, I was in the airport, I was in Hong Kong, I've been to Hong Kong, I've been to Colorado because I got a sense of that place from the airport. The next time I'm gonna visit. So Denver Airport, they wanted to be the place to celebrate when the Broncos won the Super Bowl, their football, correct? Yes? Yes, that was it. They wanted everyone to like go to the airport. The Broncos won, woo woo, go to the airport, celebrate. This, and we're, it's kind of interesting. Um, they have a Twitter page, they have 45,000 followers. One tweet was, say hi to Martha with Den's uh, canine airport therapy squad. She'll be strolling the airport wishing everyone a great day. Hashtag Dencat. So they have a canine airport therapy program. Hey, the snow has moved on and we're gearing up for the Barkitecture Doghouse Competition Award Ceremony and Auction. Join us on the Plaza 46 Beer Garden. Um, so this is sort of what, where they were, I think, about, about 10 years ago, and it's like, is that really feasible? Are people, this was before the RTD actually went out to the train, to, out to the airport, which I think is a Bedouin encampment and moves. Every time I land in Denver, I swear to God, those tents have moved like a half a mile. I just think they're really, the sand is. Um, so they're striving for this. Now, one example of an airport that really did have a sense of place and is in the process of, and the city's losing it, is Tegel Airport in Berlin. Um, and I have friends in Berlin. Andres lives in Berlin, and there's been a lot of sadness and controversy and outcry over the closing of this cute little airport that was kind of right in the center of the city. They gave you free parking for half an hour, and the scene, there was really seamless between Tegel and town, and, and flying into Berlin was like easier than flying into London or, or, or Paris. And they are moving it to the BER in Brandenburg, miles and miles away. Uh, here's one account of the new BER Willy Brandt Airport. A fine example of Schadenfreude if ever we saw one. Tourists are now paying to take tours of Germany's disastrous BER airport. There are very various options available to visitors, including bike tours, 
which wend their way around the apron, passing empty terminal buildings and gates. The bike tours are run by the airport, which true to form does not provide bicycles or helmets. Visitors must come with their own set of wheels. The airport does, however, provide a packed lunch on the two hour tour, which costs 15 euros per head. Group tours also are available of the ghostly terminals and check-in areas, dubbed the BER experience. These tours also last two hours and cost 200 euros for a group of eight. Those who sign up are currently the closest thing the airport has to passengers. So what may have been underreported or some underlying sort of tension here, I have a friend whose family has their, their dacha, their country house, in the community in the town where the airport, new airport is going. Um, the resident, this area is full of private landowners, farms, villages, the country house. So these residents saw this as an absolute invasion and potential obliteration of their communities. So I think the tension here was both the loss of an urbanly integrated airport that people were very affectionate, they really liked Tegel and the unanticipated and ill-considered impact of this new mega facility on local municipalities. So that issue is still pervading it, and I don't know if it's why the airport hasn't opened, but it is certainly sort of the 800-pound gorilla in the room. So what have airports introduced to make them more like people-friendly gathering spaces? And the question is, do these help, or are these things too much of a distraction? Um, so this is just a brainstormed list, and you could add to this. This is gleaned over many experiences over the years, traveling way too much. Music, Austin, Nashville, uh, live local bands, concerts all the time. Nashville has a piano that anyone can play. Um, there are classical piano, piano concerts in the KL Airport. Indianapolis has musical programming and a stage. Food. The Taste of Baltimore, it's all local artisans, local food, craft beer, both stardust, startups and famous familiars like Phillips Crab House. So you can get a taste of Baltimore at the airport and a crab house and a local beer, never go downtown. Chicago, their citywide healthy eating program is at the airport with airport concessions participating. The lines, however, still to continue to be longest at the McDonald's and not at those concessionaires with the healthy food. Uh, the best local charcuterie and deli in Minneapolis is at their airport. I get there early just so I can have some cheese and wine. Shopping, Amsterdam, London, Incheon, local goods, culturally significant crafts and gifts. Seating, Southwest Airlines has their comfy chairs with chargers, their Adirondack chairs in the Albany airport, their rocking chairs in the Jacksonville airport, um, kind of playing with seats. Art major art programs, San Francisco, Atlanta, Houston, world-class collections. Albany has a fabulous local artist gallery where you can actually watch the, train, the planes take off. Um, Amsterdam has the Rembrandt Museum. Albany has local artists, so there's art at these airports. Cultural offerings, calligraphy, only and Korean arts for non-Koreans, which I thought was interesting. Uh, the Haida totem pole installation in Vancouver in the arrivals area is phenomenal but you're racing through it because you know there's immigration on the other side and you're gonna be in line for two hours, but you really wanna sit there and enjoy the totems and the flora and the waterfalls. There's rooms for prayer and meditation and child's play. The Munich airport has a volleyball court, an ice skating rink, farmer's market, Christmas market, and beer garden. And except for the food, all of those on that list are offered free of charge. So my feeling is that maybe to be the commons, airports really need to mimic Main Street. Um, libraries at the airport, a post office, if you have to mail something, where do you get it? Hardware stores, five and dimes, walk-in health clinic. Um, if you've ever broken your heel running to catch a flight, you would gra gladly exchange your plane ticket for a shoe repair shop. Or I have torn my pantyhose and I need a new pair. Like, stuff happens. You need a pharmacy. You need Band-Aids. There's stuff you've forgotten and left home. So when we talk about the airport and the city, the airport mimicking the city, the city mimicking the airport, it's really maybe mimicking Main Street. Um, I just, okay. So time check. I'm, I have 24 seconds left, is that correct? I don't know. Yeah. I do. Okay, so I have a lot. I was gonna talk about security 
and public-private partnerships and Southwest Airlines um, and the, true, the nature that commons are truly self-policing, self-regulating, and self-maintained. Um, but maybe you want to ask me about that in the Q&A. I'm more than happy to we'll discuss. Do it for Q &A. Okay. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. That was a tour de force in itself. <laughs>